Ready, Todd? And, and I'm on. Okay, happy Father's Day. So you guys are getting ready. I want to tell you about these four dads that were all in the waiting room in the maternity ward. The, the nurse comes out and tells the first dad, congratulations, you had twins. And he goes, great, because I just happened to work for the twins baseball team. The second nurse comes out and says, congratulations, you had triplets. He goes, what a coincidence, I work for 3M. The next nurse comes out and says, congratulations, you had quadruplets. And the guy goes, and the guy goes I work for the Four Seasons. The fourth guy's over there banging his head on the wall. And they said, what's wrong? He said, I work for 7-Up. <laughs> anyway, back to church. Happy Father's Day, everybody. Or not everybody, the guys, the dads. And, uh, but if it wasn't for the, the women and the moms, we wouldn't be here either. So happy Sunday, everybody. Best day ever. I had a kid buy me a cupcake at school, and it had a little sticker on it that said, best day ever. So, because I bet I say that a hundred times a day to sometimes the same kid. But, um, I do have a couple of announcements. Next Sunday, we have uh, the Teen Challenge is going to be here. We don't know if it's going to be both the women and the men, or just one or the other, or both, but they're going to be here. And so... Afterwards, it is the last Sunday. It's not coffee fellowship, but we're going to have a teen challenge snack after. So if you want to stay after and you want to bring some finger food, that's what we're going to be doing after church just to visit because they usually bring, you know, several, sometimes a dozen or more people that are going to share. And so that's what we're going to be doing next week. And those are the only two things you had on your list, right? Oh, that's not on my list. Oh, this one? Soul Sisters of Hope. <laughs> Found it. I was looking for a post-it note. I didn't know, I didn't know Craig did big ones. Okay. <laughs> Soul Sisters of Hope. Next uh, meeting is on Thursday, June 30th at 9.30 here at the church to carpool to the Shoppy of Salome. <laughs> it says Shoppy. That's what they say about Gateway, too. It's the Shoppy of Gateway. <laughs> it's a, at the Mennonite store in Halsey. So they'll be back in Lynn County, the historical Pioneer Museum. And um, so, Karen, did you have anything you wanted to say about that? Um, Ooh, Chiefs, good hamburgers there. Okay. Yay, now, back to church. I'm going to pray. Okay, let's pray for the, for the Village Mission Spotlight and for our service this morning for Mike and Sarah McWinley in uh, Pierceville Federated Church in Pierceville, Can Kansas. KS. Uh, there, that's another joke, so... So, okay, let, let's pray. Father God, I want to lift up uh, the, the Mike and Sarah in their, 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 their mission field in uh, Kansas. And uh, they just want to pray that, uh, for the church members to have, who have health concerns. Pray for uni unity and love to overflow in and out of their lives and their families, their, for their specific family. And uh, to, just for... To, for Mike to be fresh in his teaching and his preaching, and uh, for Sarah would have good health and strength to minister to their church, and just pray for their children, their son that's entering, entering into a master's program, and for discernment for church leaders that they make decisions. And Lord, these are some of the same prayers that we have here. We, we thank you that Craig and Shelly are back, that they had a week to rest up, and we're giving them today to rest up even more. And uh, I know that Craig came back um, and he hit the ground running, and he's, he's, we're just trying to get him to slow down sometimes. And Because uh, we just look out for them, Lord, and we just want to lift up this church service that we can worship you in song, in your word. Uh, be with Tyler today as he gets to share with us again. And just be with each and every one of us as we, uh, we come here to worship you, Lord, and to put you first for this 
for the first part of the week, the first part of our, our day, and just to, to let you know that we love you, Lord, and that we're here for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, Pastor Craig and Shelly really are bad at taking vacations and mouthing things from the front row to make sure we don't miss announcements, things like that. We'll pretend that they're not here, and they're just some of our newest visitors. We're so glad to have you join us this morning. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very brave. <laughs> That's good. At least take away the mic. Yeah. Uh, we happen to know people in Kansas, too. So Emily and her husband, Mikel, are stationed in Wichita. So there's some people near and dear to our hearts stationed in the heat dome right now. So to uh, put our hearts in tune with worship as we begin this morning, we want to do a, a responsive reading. So, you know, I'll lead out and then if the people would join. We are here, Lord, your people, your church gathering together in your presence. We are open to each other, and we are open to you. Today, make yourself known to us. Make yourself known to us through our worship. Make yourself known to us through our prayers. Make yourself known to us through your word. This is your day, and we shall praise you. This is your day. And we shall declare your name. This is your day. And we shall worship you, our risen Savior and King. Please stand and join us as we worship him this morning. Now that we're practicing and we're going to be warm, we're going to bless our bless the Lord's name together in all of our imperfectness here. Blessed be your name. Take away. 
to worship the Lord, to celebrate how awesome he is and how much he has done for us. Let's just go to a time of prayer to talk to him, to thank him for who he is. Father God, we do. We come before you. We just gather as your people to celebrate your name and who you are. We are in awe of you. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness, the mercy that you offer to us. It's free for the taking, but Lord, there is a price. You paid that price. For us, it's a matter of following, obedience, letting you guide us in our lives. Thank you for the message of hope that your sacrifice allows us to share with others. And we just pray that, Lord, our love for each other would shine bright and, and draw people to you. We just pray that you would use this time this morning to help us to focus on you and to be attentive to what your spirit may try to teach us. So guide us, lead us, and thank you for knitting us together as this church body. In Jesus' name, amen.
children to junior church so the kiddos can leave and have a good time next door and we are happy to welcome back Tyler Jorgensen so Tyler's going to come minister to us this morning and bring us a message welcome Tyler Good morning. Good morning. Is, uh, am I on? Do you guys hear me okay? All right. Before I start, I just wanted to wish everyone here a happy Father's Day. And for you who are listening at home, I also wish you a happy Father's Day as well. A poem came to my life a couple years back, and I thought that it would be very applicable if I came to share it with you today. And this poem was... Uh, was made by a man by the name of Isaac Watts, and it was published in 1706. And the title is The Standard of a Man. Were I so tall to reach the pole or grasp the ocean with my span, I must be measured by my soul. The mind is the standard of the man. In a sense, what Watts was saying is that the standard of a man is what is inside of him. That is what counts, in his opinion, not physical appearance, because in real life, Isaac Watts was a very, very short man. And it made sense to him that it is what is on the inside that counts, and not just physical appearance or strength. Now, at this point, we can all walk away here from church today with a fuzzy feeling in our hearts, knowing that it is what is on the inside that counts and that physical appearance matters not. That is man's standard. But what is God's standard? With it being Father's Day today, the world has already given us the standards of what a man should be. We are to be stoic. We are to be emotionless. We are to be strong and brave and a lone wolf. That is what men are expected to be in the world today. That is their standards. That is the world standard. But that is not the way that God created us. And the standard of God is perfection because he is a holy God and he cannot be near sin. But because we, we were born in sin, we cannot be on God's standards unless we believe in Jesus' name. And after that, the amazing thing is, is that we are seen perfect in God's eyes at that point. 
But our life is not done once we believe in Jesus. Because some people think, once we believe in Jesus, well, I'm a Christian now, and my destiny is foretold, and I don't need to do anything else. I mean, sure, but there is a lot more things that you need to do. Like, in a sense, when you are done with basic training in the armed forces, sure, your training is done, but for the next four years, or however long you want to spend in the armed forces, you have a job, a role, a support role that you have to do afterwards. In the Bible, God has commanded us to do so many things after we have believed in Jesus and to do his will. And by doing them, we can grow more and more into understanding the Lord and understanding what God's standards are. And God's standard of a man is something that every Christian should seek or hold accountable to. God's standard of a man is something that we should seek or hold accountable to. Both to men and women, these qualities are to be sought after. And with these three responsibilities, we can know and grow in the Lord and understand the way he wants us to live our lives here on earth. And when Jesus was walking on the earth, being the teacher that he is, he taught his disciples many lessons to love your neighbor more than yourself and many others. And if I were here to tell you every single one, we'd be here until next Sunday. But before Jesus left the earth to return to heaven, Jesus gave one more job for his disciples to do. As it is written in Matthew chapter 26, verses 18 and 20. If we can all turn to Matthew, chapter 26, verses 18 and 20. He said, wait, no, that's the wrong, whoops, that's the wrong, I'm sorry. Um, here we go. He, uh, chapter 28, verses 16 through 18. I'm sorry, it says 26, I meant to be 28. It says, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the very end of the age. From this passage, we can clearly see that it is our duty as Christians to tell others about what Jesus did for them on the cross, which brings us to our first responsibility. It is our responsibility to evangelize. If there is one thing that I would like all of you to take away from this sermon after today, is that when Jesus says to go and make disciples of all nations, he said that as a command not as an option. And some say that, and Jesus didn't say this matter of factly because he died for this. And some people think that Jesus said something along, along the lines of this. You know, like, if you tell other people about Jesus, that's okay, but if you don't, well, that's okay too. That is not true. That is unbiblical. And that is not what God said when he said this passage. When God said, go and make disciples of all nations, he said that as a command. And as Christians, God is our five-star general, and he's just given us our marching orders. It may be hard for some to share their faith with another person, but when our general gives us an order, he expresses, he expresses, us to do it. Because if we 
as Christians do not tell the next generation and the generation after that about what Christ did for them on the cross and how much he loved them, there won't be any more Christians in the next generation. And if, so, if, no, if we won't, as Christians, no one will. And if someone has never told another person about Jesus, God still loves you. And he loves you just as much as any other person here. And he still loves you. Say, but I also, as a person, I have a hard time telling other people, people about Jesus. For instance, if someone asks a vague question uh, to me that I know the answer to, my brain answers before my mouth, and I end up stuttering or saying something wrong, and at the end of the conversation, we both end up more confused than when we started. And even if I might bend myself over backwards with our conversation, the Holy Spirit will give me the words to say, because I am sharing the gospel with a willing heart. And it says in John chapter 14, verses 26, John chapter 14, verses 26, it says, it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, this is Jesus speaking, who who will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you the remembrance of all that I have said to you. Thankfully, there are countless ways to share the gospel effectively and clearly because when we share the gospel, we do not want to share it in a way that is hard to understand or a way that is vague. If any way possible, we want to share the gospel in a way that is as clear and as understanding as possible. One of my favorite ways to share the gospel is using the wordless book and like the name suggests, it's a book without words. And each of, and inside this book, instead of words, there are five colors, and each of these colors represents the gospel story. And um, there are countless ways to share the gospel, but one way that will always stick to me is when I was attending Camp Creek School, and Christy Connor would have us all gathered here around the stage, and she would give us five colored boxes the boxes that fit into one another, and she would have us toss the boxes to her as we would sing a song. And if you know the song, you can sing along. My heart was black with sin until the Savior came in. His precious blood, I know, has turned me white as snow. And in God's word I'm told, I'll walk the streets of gold. And day by day I'll grow, cause that's God's way I know. Great singing, great singing. (laughs) Uh, Me, I'm... uh, (laughs) And from there, at that point, Christy used that opportunity to tell us kids about Jesus. And I think at that point, that's when I came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And there, like I've said, there are countless ways to share the gospel. I know that some friends back at Frontier the School of the Bible, they like to use tracks. Others, they use even more creative methods, like using a Rubik's Cube type of device called an Advanced Cube. And you turn this way, it shows a cross. You turn that way, it shows an open grave, and so on and so forth. And all it takes is to step out in faith and find which method of sharing the gospel works best with you and me. And by sharing the gospel faithfully and with a pure heart, it might lead the Holy Spirit to plant a seed in the person we are speaking to or, God willing, win souls for Christ. It says in Proverbs chapter 11, verses 3, Proverbs Chapter 11, verses 30, says, Proverbs 11, 30, it says, The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and whoever captures a soul is wise. By telling others about Jesus, both you and I are fulfilling our marching orders bringing glory to God and 
serving others. Speaking of serving, looking to Jesus, he is the model of what a servant is supposed to look like. He is the very creator of every single atom in the universe and creator of the entire cosmos. But he came down to earth as a man to serve. Praise God for that. And even yet, he came down to die on a criminal cross. He deserved to be worshipped. But he chose to serve. And a perfect picture of Jesus' humble servitude can be found in John chapter 13, verses 3 and 5. If we could all turn to John chapter 13, verses 3 and 5. See if I got the right verse this time. Yes, I did. Let's go. All right. Uh, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. To grow and understand God's standards better, it is our responsibility to serve others. It is our responsibility to serve others. And Jesus' model of Christian service is something that we ought to sought after and to model after. To put others above ourselves, even if it hurts. The fact that Jesus washed Judas's feet. The fact that Jesus washed Judas's feet even though he knew that that night he would betray him. That is the, the, the level of servitude that Jesus had towards his disciples. And that is something we should model after. A saying was brought to my attention a while back. Life come, makes sense when you put Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. And if you put Jesus, others last, in order, it spells joy. If you put Jesus, others, yourself second, and, uh, no, others second, and yourself last. I, I, I knew there was something wrong with that statement. When we put others first, and when we put God first and others second, our life gets put into perspective. Now, one of the most important things when it comes to serving is serving with a willing heart. Christians can and should serve at every opportunity that they can, but it brings and it because it brings glory to God and lets our light shine for others, as Jesus. Uh, but if a person does not have a good attitude with serving, or serving with wrong or selfish or ulterior motives, it would be better if they don't serve at all. For the sake of illustration, imagine you are with your friends and they just told you that there is an amazing restaurant in Spring Desert and you should probably go. It's great food, great service, really good. So you think to yourself, yeah, I should probably go. So on a Friday night, you head over there, and the table is kind of covered with crumbs, and, and that kind of happens at restaurants. It doesn't bother you too much. And after waiting for a little bit, the waiter comes over, and it's obvious from you that, it's obvious that you can tell that he doesn't want to be there, he does not care about your food, and he wants to be somewhere else. And perturbed, you wait for 45 minutes for your food to get here, and at that point, your steak and your potatoes that you order it gets brought to you. And the steak is cold, and it's undercooked. And believe it or not, the potato that you ordered, they replaced it with horseradish instead of sour cream. <laughs> horseradish. And at last, you, at the, after you finish your meal, you storm off, you pay your bill, and you head back home. And whenever someone says that, oh my gosh, that restaurant in town in Springfield, oh, it's amazing. It will bring a bitter taste to 
empty them out. And so is the same for the church. If someone who is an unbeliever is needing help from the church for service, and they get served with an ulterior motive, a selfish intent, or obviously doesn't want to be there, it will bring Christianity, it will bring a sour taste to their mouth. As Christians, we should serve as Jesus did, wholeheartedly, faithfully, and sincerely. Jesus is the model of servanthood, as well as anything else when it comes to this life. But if we ever want to learn how to serve, look to Jesus' example of washing his disciples' feet. Now that we know what it takes to serve, look, uh, no, uh, serve others as Christ served his disciples, and we can know that we can apply his teachings to this very day. Like, for example, um, we are always asking for people to help with the nursery. We can serve there. And like my mom and my sister do, and countless other ladies, they serve by helping behind the counter at Coffee Fellowship. There's help that's needed at Village Mission, uh, at um, the Eugene Mission for volunteers, and you can help with the children or youth program. You can serve everywhere in our community. All we need to do is open our eyes and go out there. It is our responsibility as Christians to serve others. We can do all of our part and serve each other and unbelievers so that when they think of Christianity, it will bring a sweet taste to their mouth. I do not know everyone's personal story, but I do know that fatherhood, is, I do not know if fatherhood brings a sweet or sour taste to your mouth, but today is indeed Father's Day. Father's Day is a day to recognize and celebrate fathers. Celebrate fathers, uncles, grandfathers, and father figures, anything under the sun. It's a day to recognize the influence that they have had in our lives. But if any married man can tell you, being a father is not easy. Is the job of the father to lead the family? Which brings us to our third and final responsibility to understand God's standard of a man. It is our responsibility as men to lead the family. This is not saying that husbands should be dictators or should be a helicopter parent over everything in and out of the family life. That would be both wrong and unbiblical. The Bible's definition of leadership is influence. And as a father influences his family in a positive manner, he sets an example for his wife and his children. Like in 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul writes to Timothy to be an influence for good in his congregation. If we could all turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. I love the turning of pages. It's freedom. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Paul was asking Timothy to be a positive example to his congregation. And I know from the example from my father of what a father is supposed to do and how a father is supposed to lead the family. With my father's mannerisms, his humbleness, his kindness, my father exuberates Christ or overflows with Christ in his life. My dad has, has influenced myself and my family to follow after Christ ever since we started attending this church a long time ago. His influence of love toward us over all these years has shown that my dad speaks after God. And seeing my earthly father show unrestrained love towards me and my family, seeking after his heavenly father, that influence has led me to follow after Christ. But I know that my dad was not alone in this journey. For 25 years this summer, my mother has helped my father 
to seek after Christ. My parents have supported, loved, and encouraged each other to seek after the Lord and one another. And my mom is an illustration of what a... My mom is an illustration of how a woman is to influence her husband in logic and in love for Christ. <laughs> Marriage is not a one-person job. And it's not a one-person operation. It requires a team. And the husband and wife have the roles. And for husbands, it is their responsibility as men to lead the family. And for wives, to respect their husbands and to be mothers to their children. That is the way that God intended it. And to pray and praise God for that. There can be modifications, of course, in the roles, but that is the way God intended it from the beginning of the world. And ever since the beginning of the world, God has set the standard of a man. God's standard of a man is something that every Christian should hold or seek to be accountable to. And to grow and understand God, we are given responsibilities to help us grow closer to God. It is our responsibility to evangelize. It is our responsibility to be a servant to others and for men to lead the family. But um, there are many responsibilities that can be listed here today. But if I, were to leave, if I were to tell you all the responsibilities that God has for us as Christians, like I said earlier, we'd be here until next Sunday, the Sunday after that next Sunday. Even though I cannot list them all, I encourage you all, myself included, to dive into God's Word and see the responsibilities that it has for us all. We will never reach perfection here on earth because of sin. But because of sin, God has every right to send us to the lake of fire because we have disobeyed our five-star general. He is a holy God, but God loves humanity so much that he sent his one and only Son die for us on the cross. And by dying on the cross, he rose again on the third day, and now he's ruling in heaven as king. Jesus paid for my sins. He paid for your sins. Past, present, and future. And now God looks upon us with rose-colored glasses. And which means that he looks upon us favorably. Now, because, now that once we believe in Jesus' name, we are justified and sanctified in God's eyes. He, and because of that, he now gives us jobs and roles to fulfill, to serve, to evangelize, to be a father, and to be anything under the sun God wants us to be. The mind might not be the standard of the man but to serve God wholeheartedly, I know that, that that is the standard of a man. Thank you. That was my son, who I am well pleased. <laughs> it's very encouraging to see Tyler's growth as he's walked through Christianity as, with some professional training and to see him becoming the man that he is. Um, there's a Father's Day presentation video that we'd like you to, to watch and uh, maybe get a little bit of enjoyment out of. If you're still struggling with life in the real world, you're going to love our latest home speaker device. Hey, Dad, what kind of pliers should I use on this? Uh, you should be using a wrench. Oh, do I have a wrench? You have three. Ah, thanks, Dad. Introducing the Dad Personal Assistant, our newest smart speaker with all the character and compassion of a father. 
up and at him. It's a beautiful day. Dad, it's Saturday. Yeah, it's a great day to get outside. It's 6 a.m. Well, then you better get moving before it gets any later. Designed with advanced features, the Dad PA connects to all your other smart home devices. Dad, please set the thermostat to 70 degrees. No problem. Setting the thermostat to 68 degrees. Um, no, let's keep it at 70 degrees. Sure thing. Thanks, Dad. We're going to save so much money. He syncs with your calendar to help you stay on track. Looks like you're overdue for an oil change. Oh, hey, you're right. Can you schedule one for Friday? I've already got it scheduled. Just don't miss it, okay? <laughs> okay, I won't. <laughs> Seriously, don't miss it. The Dad PA is always watching out for you. Lights on. Uh, hey, it's getting late. I think it's about time for Brad to head home. <sighs> Dad? The Dad Personal Assistant includes a wealth of knowledge and opinions on a wide variety of subjects. Dad, can you help me with my taxes? Dad, do you know a good mechanic? Hey, Dad, can you tell me a joke? Sure. The joke is one billion dollars. Yeah, I don't get it. That's right. And you never will. Ah, nice one. <laughs> Oh, I'm hilarious. Based on God's original design, the dad personal assistant is wise, caring, faithful, and devoted. Don't worry. You've got this. You are the strongest person I know. You have made me so proud. You are God's child, and you don't need anyone else to complete you, especially not Brad. <sighs> Really, Dad? I'm just saying, there's other fish in the sea. Okay, wow. The Dad Personal Assistant. Always thoughtful, always dependable, and always there for you. As we close out our service, will you please stand? Men, there will be a gift that will be passed out by the deaconesses at the back of the church as we exit and as you have an opportunity to visit with one another. Please receive this blessing from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Please go forth in your heavenly name.